As you may recall last time, we covered uh, warm-up exercises, uh, line exercises, the construct approach, and line and tone. Uh, what we're going to do today is do a finished sketch, a rendering. Now, there are many approaches to rendering, uh, but the fundamentals we will go through here. Uh, I have on this pad a construct which I've already pre-prepared, and it's important to note that, as I stressed in the last tape, we have drawn this pretty much like a computer drawing, uh, translucent boxes, uh, gauging proportions, looking at the interfaces of the various elements as they come together. Now, it is a very rough construct, and we now have to address before rendering uh, the surface development of that object. Uh, naturally, uh, in a construct, we're more interested in uh, the geometric and perspective uh, elements coming together. Uh, and I have no foreshortening. Uh, I have no extreme uh, uh, perspective distortions. So now I can tackle the surface development. That means that I'm going to go over all of these lines with uh, either French curves or radius templates to establish the crowns and uh, uh, radius, uh, radius sections on this product. So I'll start by moving my sweep, the French curve, along here. And I'm using a thick pencil. Ordinarily, for a line drawing, I would use a much finer, uh, uh, much finer pencil. But in the interest of viewing this on the screen, I'm using the uh, same old medium tip uh, marker that uh, we used last time. So here we go again, putting in uh, all my crown surfaces. All the straight lines are, are going to become, as we go, uh, slightly curved, as it would be in this uh, injection molded product. But I'm using all the, uh, the construct lines, the fine construct lines that I have to guide this sweep uh, or French curve along here to make sure that I'm getting the right amount of, of um, crowning along the various edges. You can do this freehand if you like, but I, I am looking for a much tighter uh, sketch in here, so I'm apt to use uh, uh, templates such as ellipse guides and uh, uh, French curves. We will be doing some sections along this product because at some point when we reach the rendering stage where we have to apply color, it's important that we uh, understand which surface is uh, uh, derived, let's say, from a cylinder, which surface is derived from a cone, which surface is a, a flat or faceted, as you may recall. We dealt with that in the last tape, you know, drawing cubes, cylinders, etc. Uh, so this has a purpose in that uh, we are all going to bring these various elements together in this uh, orbital sander. Uh, tell you the truth, I'd much rather be drawing a car here, but uh, in the School of Industrial Design we do small products such as orbital sanders, uh, drills, and so forth. So I thought I might do one of those. So we have to take our time here as we go, make sure that uh, all the lines are going to perspective. Even though we are doing curved lines, we still have vanishing points to contend with. And uh, I am uh, checking as I go here uh, to make sure that those uh, curved lines that I'm putting in or modifying are indeed going to the va right vanishing point. We may, uh, in some instances, you know, go through several of these drawings or overlays to make sure we've got all the right uh, character lines in, and that the sketch looks good also from a distance. Right now, I'm working fairly close to the pad at a distance of about um, 18 to 20 centimeters. I'm almost right on the pad, so I can't oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, tell if there's any distortion. So it's a good idea as you're doing uh, uh, your sketch uh, to stand back some distance from it, just uh, prop it up on an easel or pin it up on the wall or something and uh, 
take a good look to make sure that uh, you're not getting any uh, excessive foreshortening or any distortion in some of the uh, uh, the line work here. Again, this is a, a very crude preliminary stage, but a necessary one. It's uh, going to be helpful in the end, because if you don't have a good line drawing, if you don't really understand before you start applying color uh, exactly what every surface is doing, uh, <coughs> you will be in trouble at some point in the sketch. So the time that you take at this stage prepping your drawing, making sure that the perspective is right and the surfaces are doing exactly as what they should be doing uh, is time well spent and uh, will save you an awful lot of heartache in the end. And again, as I mentioned, I may do not just one of these, but several, and pick the most likely uh, uh, candidate, if you will, for the, f for the rendering, because I may spend anywhere from one to two hours on a good rendering, so I want to make sure that uh, it's, uh, the product is shown to good advantage. So there may be, for every rendering that I do, um, five or six uh, tissues or line drawings like this one. Well, we won't have time to go through the whole three hours. What we're going to do here is fairly simple, and this um, um, this line drawing should do. There we go. Now, each surface that I put down, uh, each radius tells me that I'm going to get, depending on my light source, which is yet to be determined, or perhaps not yet to be determined, because I've already put a cast shadow there, but let's say that I wanted to cast a shadow the other side, I would have to be mindful of the surfaces, you know, where the radiuses are happening, the radii, so that I know where the highlight core and reflected light is going to go. All right, there we go. On this orbital sander, I'm going to have some ventilation uh, up on top here, so I'm going to put these in now. And uh, notice that the uh, French curve is giving me that sort of crowned effect. You know, I mean, I can't get that with a straight edge. I have to use a French curve because there isn't a uh, really a hard edge on, on the surface of this product. It's all crowned for... Uh, uh, production purposes and also aesthetics. Okay. I'm basically locating where the vents are going to go. Down here we have the the uh, plate where the sanding paper is attached. That's just a rubber pad, if you will, uh, that's black, so I don't need to worry about uh, uh, ex extensive surface development here. It's just a black uh, swatch located underneath the product. I'm going to go back here and just uh, fine-tune the switch, put in a little radius. Mind you, uh, even if you didn't apply color or tone or any of the niceties that go with the rendering, uh, this sketch, uh, as tight as it is now, is good enough to communicate a number of things. Uh, the proportions, for example, the uh, uh, taper that we have for the motor housing, the crowning for the uh, uh, housing down below here, and the, uh, the not vents, but exhaust down, down here. So there's enough information about the product already conveyed, <coughs> and one could uh, very well uh, make an in-house uh, sort of presentation to other uh, team members of a design uh, uh, group or uh, to your instructors. But if you have a presentation to management, uh, these guys require uh, somewhat more finished uh, 
uh, looking sketch because they they do not understand nor can they interpret the uh, our uh, jargon our design jargon like construction lines etc they need to see uh, the product as uh, realistically as possible either through modeling uh, uh, an exact replica or a uh, extremely well finished sketched but we're not in the illustration business and I may have mentioned at the beginning there are many many uh, techniques for uh, illustrating and sketching and I encourage you to look them up what I'm going to do here today is just uh, acquaint you with the basics so we now have our line drawing completed I'm going to do a bit of surface development here and what is that? Well, it's just to find out, again, as uh, we alluded to in the construct method last time, uh, look at what the surfaces are doing. So I put in a center line, all right, and I know that this is going to uh, crown over, then that dips down there and picks up again, goes down, and in here we go right inside. There'll probably be a little radius down below here. And I'm going to use my sweep again. Just go bring that center line up here. And I've got to remember that I've got a radii on the edge there. So that will give me a highlight. And as we've already indicated by this uh, section line here for the vents, we've got crowning uh, on top. Then we dip slightly and pick up again the ridge just at the, uh, the toggle switch. And we can go across here, uh, down, back up again. Uh, take that across to uh, across the handle and roll that over so I know that I'm going to get probably a highlight around there. I can do a cross section around here. Just uh, take that uh, across the top of the motor housing and come down over here with a radius just um, pull this down again that would be nice and and consistent with that one we're going back inside out radius and then we pull straight down and tuck under here so here if we want to focus just a little bit on the sections uh, we have essentially uh, the ingredients uh, uh, the basics of uh, surface development I may also want to do a section across here uh, let's do that. We're going to get a, a fillet right in through here, and this will crown the other way. So that will tell me that, in fact, we won't see the hard lines that we see here as edges. We will not be seeing in the finished uh, sketch because there'll be highlights, because that's a cylinder. Uh, there may be some edge tone and, and core uh, value there because we're on the shadow side. But uh, uh, typically, we would uh, we would not get very very much uh, value on on that uh, on that uh, on the edge of that cylinder there. We would get highlights. Uh, the other thing that we talked about in the last tape were cast shadows. So I've already drawn this cast shadow, and I did mention that the shadow should not overpower the product. So I've tried to compress it uh, as much as I could here. And uh, that's just to anchor it to the ground, if you will, as opposed to having this product floating in midair. So uh, I'll tell you what I'm drawing here once I've finished outlining it for you to see. All right. We have this corner here, which is being reflected uh, or cast uh, over here. We've got the motor housing up here, and then we've got the bit of a handle there. And then that's the back corner of the product. So this is enough to, uh, to anchor it to the, the page. All right? So we're done. Our surface development is finished. And I have uh, done another overlay of this uh, because the lines were all together too um, uh, too coarse for the final rendering. Uh, and this is what we have now. I have made some uh, adjustment in the surface development. I have softened some areas even more. I have uh, 
um, given the uh, motor housing a little bit more crown. And again, this process of fine-tuning your design and so on would, uh, would require perhaps several tissues. So now I'm ready to lay in color, the basic values. And we have to understand here that we've got, again, one light source. And we had discussed this in uh, the previous tape. Uh, we now need to uh, give uh, form to this object to really uh, make it a three-dimensional uh, object on, on the page here. So we're going to have to pretty much use watercolor techniques. This is a build up the values gradually because we don't want to overshoot or overdo it with uh, too dark a value to begin with. So I've got uh, one marker here which I brought with me. It's a yellow ochre which is typical of the colors uh, that we find on these products. Uh, it's a good thing to uh, test your values uh, before you start to make sure that you've got the right color. Uh, there's nothing worse than laying down a color and then finding out that it's too dark or too light or not quite the, uh, um, doesn't give you quite the range that you're after and then having to do another drawing. So uh, take the time to establish your palette of colors before you start. Now again, since this is a <coughs> the rudiments of rendering, I'm going to use uh, basically one or two markers, no more. My light source is coming from the left side, so I'm going to uh, start shading uh, every surface that is away from the, uh, from the light source. So I'm laying in color very quickly, and I'm using a uh, broad uh, tip marker this time, just trying to lay in as much color as I can. And to do that quickly, because the marker has a tendency, as you know, to bleed. And if you don't want it bleeding too much, it's, it's uh, good to uh, keep the strokes fairly, fairly quick and fairly direct. So here <coughs> I've already built up on the shadow side the, uh, the highlight, the core, and the reflected light. On this side here, we're going to have uh, probably some reflected light uh, thrown back into perspective a little la later on. But for the time being, I'm going to leave it like that. On this side here, I'm going to come back and do a quick wash again with the same marker. A little quicker now, because I want this value to be fairly light. And I'm keeping consistent vertical strokes here. You'll notice on the horizontal elements, I am going with horizontal stripes, and on the vertical elements, uh, with uh, vertical strikes, uh, strokes. Uh, let's go over here to the main uh, housing. I'm going to do a quick outline here with the marker. Just a quick sweep. And I'm going to do the shadow side first. So paper is buckling a little bit. I'm going to work from, uh, from this side. building up the values gradually. Now I'm using that uh, newsprint that you saw me sketching on earlier, on earlier tapes. Of course, you, uh, you do have the option of uh, using vellum, in which case you can work both sides of the paper, or your, uh, your trusty uh, uh, letter set pad, which will give you a uh, probably a smoother texture. But we can get something that reads pretty well with, with the newsprint. I'm going to outline again, leaving my highlight, as you see there, intact, coming over with uh, quick strokes. Now you're going to overshoot a little bit, but the important thing to remember is that in a drawing or a, a presentation sketch or a color sketch, um, or even rendering, it's what it, uh, how it reads from a distance. Because you'll be pinning those up on a wall, and uh, what's important is for the viewer to understand what the shape is doing from a distance of, let's say, five feet. Now, I'm going to put um, some more tone here, but because this is a somewhat shiny <coughs> or a semi lustrous uh, finish, I'm going to pop in a little bit of reflections. And notice what I'm doing here 
I'm switching the, uh, the direction of the stroke pattern. But I'm doing this very, very quickly um, so as not to bleed excessively. All right, I'm going to go back here. Here we discussed the highlights, but we got a screw there uh, that's inset, so that's going to be fairly dark in there. And then we can pick up the highlight just in here. Same thing happening over here. And uh, here I'm going to put some edge tone. I'm going across my fine lines that ordinarily would be underneath the paper, but I've uh, elected to do them on, on the surface here because on newsprint it's very difficult to... Uh, and here I'm putting some reflections that are going to the right vanishing point. A little rooster tail there. And then I <coughs> stipple with the... Uh, with the marker as I go, I'm looking at what's happening and I'm determining whether I've got enough value there and so on. And touching up, just as you would with a brush. Getting the thing to read. Uh, top surface here, we're going to stroke across in this direction. Because I'm going to have to put some uh, vents in there. Here I'm dipping down a little bit, so that's going to be a little darker in here. And we pick up the light around this area here. Don't want too much value on the top. But here I'm going to be a little darker, because I'm away from the light source. And just uh, edge tone, highlight. Uh, So I'm doing as much with this marker as I can because I don't want to come back and do some touch-ups later on. So <coughs> surfaces that need more, more tone, more value. You see the amount of the range that I can get out of this yellow ochre? I don't need to really switch to any other marker. This one will do it for us. Get this area again. And come back here and maybe put uh, a tad more reflections. Okay. Uh, with the marker, you're not going to get uh, the same sort of effect as you would in a gouache rendering. When we talk about renderings in industrial design and any uh, industry, like the automotive industry, when we say rendering, do a rendering, it means uh, get your brushes out and do a painting. And that takes uh, probably five to six hours, depending on the size and the, uh, the complexity of the illustration. But uh, when we talk about rendering in the School of Industrial Design here, we mean a presentation sketch. But if some of you want to uh, really get at it and spend a lot of time, uh, which is not wasted, mind you, it's, uh, you know, you can develop a style of your own, and d uh, rendering techniques do affect, to some extent, uh, some uh, design uh, uh, design character as well. You know, character lines and so on. The style that you develop in sketching can very oftentimes um, uh, give your product that flair, that little je ne sais quoi, as we say in French, that uh, other sketches may not have. Okay, so we've got. Uh, I don't know if we can see it on the camera. Yes, I guess we can. Uh, <coughs> the basic value patterns established. We've got a bit of highlight left over uh, in here. So what I'm going to do now is just to come back and punch up this drawing with a, a bit of line work, contour line. And I'm pulling out my black marker again, and I'm going to tweak. And some of the bleed areas and the overshoots will, uh, will uh, disappear. All right. My presentation sketches in industry are always um, uh, fairly large, much larger than this, and uh, rely usually on marker, a bit of uh, gouache, but it's, uh, it's mostly a colored uh, sketch. Uh, and I like the... Uh, the idea of seeing the strokes and some of the, the uh, spontaneity of the, the sketch in the uh, rendering. 
And I'm going to use my sweep here to clean that up because it makes for a fresher, more artistic, uh, and less stale looking uh, uh, finished, um, finished uh, piece. So here I'm using the marker. Now you, you have uh, the option of outlining or not outlining, but the reason why I'm doing it here is because <coughs> I've got some bleed marks, and you'll see that it makes the, uh, uh, the product read quite a, quite a bit. You know, from a distance, again, we're concerned about presentation and being able to understand what's going on. And, uh, you know, the uh, sander without any of this uh, bold graphic outline would not uh, read as well. And I'm trying to do this, tell you the truth, because it's boring uh, to deal with a box. Uh, I don't like doing boxes or orbital sanders. I like cars, fluid shapes. So I'm trying to make this thing here, which is very uh, uninteresting, uh, somewhat a little bit more lively by putting speed marks. You can see how I overshoot with, with some of the markers I have here. Now, maybe the toggle uh, switch will make black, since I have a black marker here. It could be gray or green or any other color. That's up to you. And I'm just uh, popping in the values here. I'm going to leave a, a bit of highlight there. And then come back with uh, a bit of black here. All right, and we can probably goose that up with a Prismacolor pencil a little later on. We've got this uh, foot pad here, and that I'm not going to put black because I don't want to lose it completely into the cast shadow. And. Uh, I'll probably use a number five or six gray. I really don't know what I have here with me in way of grays, but uh, whatever it is, that's what we're going to have to use. I oftentimes find that, uh, you know, uh, the fewer the tools you have, uh, the greater opportunity for you to improvise. A sketch, a good presentation sketch, doesn't require for you to go out there and buy $600 worth of supplies. Uh, I have uh, found uh, it fascinating to sketch with... Uh, a brush and a cup of coffee. You know, when I didn't have any paint, I'd use my uh, my coffee and a brush on uh, on newsprint, and it gives a beautiful, you know, sepia tone. Or I keep my dry markers as well because they uh, uh, enable you to do some uh, uh, shading and uh, tonal value. Uh, sketching, just like if you had a charcoal pencil, which is infinitely more messy a medium. I stopped using uh, charcoal a long time ago, largely, I suspect, because uh, of dry cleaning bills. Um, in here, I may elect at some point, you know, I'll see how that goes, you know, pop in some more, some darker values in there. Uh, I'm going to have to start noodling here, doing some uh, louvers, or vents. And I'll do one side first, all right, and see how that works out. And um, uh, these constitute uh, not just venting, but also ribbing in the plastic, so it makes the plastic stronger. So we're going to pop these in now. Well, there's one yellow and one black. You've got to remember that. And I'm using my French curve here to make sure I'm not uh, losing the surface development that we uh, talked about earlier on the tissue or the underlay. There we go. Just pull that down nice and easy. And if I've got little, any sort of radii to do, I can put that in and uh, let's see, maybe these louvers are too big, but for the sake of our presentation here, let's say black, yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow. I need another one. So I have to, no, that doesn't quite work out. You see, these things happen sometimes. But in any case, if, if that were a major problem here, 
what you do is black that out, you know, and just re, re uh, uh, redraw them in uh, with uh, white prisma color for the outline. But let's see what uh, we're just going to use four. Let's see one one black, one yellow, one red. Okay, let's let's do that. So let's go with black in here. If that happens, then your instructor says, well, why uh, don't you have four louvers? And you say, well, because I've done some wind tunnel testing and I found out that three, three are enough. There you go. I, I did mention that, uh, however, on a serious note, when you're designing or before you set out to do renderings, you may do uh, several tissues, and the tissues are also design drawings. You're making design decisions as you go, and um, louvers and uh, openings and things like that are important design detailing, but you see I haven't thought about that because in being a car designer, again, we don't do louvers anymore. We just have a a little mouth uh, below the car in the valence that sucks up the air. You know, and Venturi ducts are far nicer than uh, than louvers. We used to do louvers back in the 60s. All right, so we're going to pop some on the other side here using my French curve, just dragging that uh, across. I'm looking at the time here. Uh, we're we almost done for this segment. Let's see. And we got this filling in with black. Okay. I took a little break here, and I've added a number of things, like the shadow, cast shadow, and uh, the pad in gray, and added uh, just a suggestion of a vignette. Now, this can be up to you, left up to you, but since we are dealing with, uh, with uh, woodworking, et cetera, and power tools, I mean, it could be a theme uh, dealing with wood or uh, putting up a fence or, you know, doing furniture, finishing and, and touching up. So you, could, you might suggest with the vignette to make the sketch uh, or the rendering, if you will, uh, slightly more interesting, some environmental background here that would be suggestive of the um, activities uh, involved with the tool. Or you could do a user, a kind of user cycle, um, but uh, that's entirely up to you. I'm going to do one of my favorite things here. These are little uh, specks of light that occur on uh, the uh, uh, edges of the, of the product, uh, you know, facing the light source. And even in, in the shadow side, you get some reflected light. So here we start with this big radius over here. So I'm going to pop just one big juicy one. And I'm using a, a whiteout. I, don't, I forgot my gouache. Uh, so I'm using uh, something that I borrowed from the uh, secretary's office here. It's white out for typewriter. It's not uh, quite the same thing as gouache, but it'll have to do. So here I'm popping little highlights on, on the edge, uh, right down here as well, maybe on the corner of the pad here. This is not as good as a Winsor Newton brush, but it'll have to do. And uh, over on the louvers here, maybe just a little ping of light. It works better if you apply a small amount with this stuff. Um, how's that reading? I guess it does read. Uh, right along this radius here, down below, in here, over here on that edge. The inside edge there is in uh, shadow, but this one here would be uh, highlighted uh, right on this edge and along the, the edge of that 
minutes, which it's not as as uh, handy as a brush, but it uh, it's okay. Let's see here. Uh, we'll have ping of light there. Ping, 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 ping over here along that uh, radius here. Maybe even on the corner here before we hit that. Uh, Ping, and then we'll just make sure, and we're done. We don't have <coughs> a beautiful, pristine uh, oil painting here done by Rembrandt, but we have a presentation sketch which, to most observers, will read as an orbital sander. Uh, there are uh, details that uh, you can talk about, assuming this were your design. Uh, you could talk about the location of uh, the various controls and switches, uh, the ergonomics, the motor housing, the use of uh, uh, plastic housing and tooling, etc. And uh, with management, you, dis you sh could discuss such things as, uh, as uh, color or graphics, uh, etc. So this is what rendering or sketching is all about in industrial design. I hope you've enjoyed the show, and I encourage you to keep on sketching and to the extent that you enjoy multimedia uh, rendering. Thank you.